How many of you would say, how many of you would say, if I just had a little more money, most of the problems I have would just go away? Right? Show of hands. Show of hands. Come on, be honest with me. I know what it feels like. I, if I'm honest, I would say a lot of the same things. Oh, I'd be able to do this and that. And that's a very common answer is if I just had a little more money, my, my problems would, would go away. And, and many people do. Uh, I brought up with me, um, these are right here. These are prayer requests. They're anonymous. You know, we have a prayer meeting uh, on every Saturday at 9 o'clock. And I don't know, there's no names on these. But um, I just thought I, I'd share because I, I know that people are thinking about this. Pastor, why, why, would you, why would you do a financial series like this? You know people hate that, right? Yeah, I, I know. I know. But at the same time, I know they're struggling. Because listen, uh, finding employment. A home for my family. Finances. It's written right on there. I don't know who that is, but we're praying for you. We've been praying for you. Uh, dealing with a work situation. Different, but not really. Okay? Direction for work and for finances. Um, pray for provision. Again, different, not really. Um, I've been struggling financially and would really love some prayer. This is just a handful, and I'm just letting you know. I, we get the prayer requests, and we, we pray. We keep them anonymous when they ask for that, and when they don't care, we, we put them out there, but a lot of the prayer requests have to do with finances. So many. And these are just the ones that came in. I bet if I went around and talked to every single one of you, you would probably agree this is something that I, I, I could use some help with. I could use some, some help. I could use God to, to show up in my life. Well, that's why this series is called Money Matters. And it matters to Jesus too. It matters to Jesus. Did you know that 16 out of Jesus' 38 parables were about money? I, I wonder why that was. Because we're... Worst we think about it. He knows how to get our attention. He's not foolish. He's, he's kind of smart, isn't he? Isn't he, everybody? We're in church. You can say, yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's smart. Matthew 6, 21 says this, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Notice the order. Notice the order. He says, where you put your treasure, there your heart will go. You would think it's the other way around, wouldn't you? You would think it's, oh, well, wherever my heart is, then I'm going to invest there. That's not what he said. He said, where you choose to put your treasure, where you invest, your heart is going to follow that thing. So he's saying, invest in the right thing. Make sure that your heart is following where your provision goes, where your, where your, where your treasure is going. If we learn to put our treasure in the right place, our heart will also be in the right place. So I just Googled it. I thought, hey, let's just keep it simple today. And I Googled it. Google, what's the number one uh, what's the number one struggle in marriage? What's the number one reason that fights occur? <laughs> Thank you so much. I feel so supported right now. I do. I feel encouraged. It's not easy. It's not easy to meddle in people's finances. I understand. I mean, it's, it's just the way it is. So it's, it's nice that you're kind of helping me out a little bit. It's, it's, it's pretty good. It's, uh, it's, it's a big deal. The number one reason for fights is financial. And Google said that one quarter of divorces have to do with finances. If you listen to Dave Ramsey, he says it's one half. So let's just split the difference. A lot. This is a big deal. This, this really is a big deal. Why would pastors and teachers not want to talk about this such serious issue? And I'll be honest with you. Let me get vulnerable with you right out the gate. Um, Tiffany and I struggled with this area. We really did. Um, not so much with the tithing, but like with just how to manage money. When we were early married, you know, we were, we were married and, and we were always like giving and all that, but um, we ended up in some debt because we just were stupid. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> we were just dumb and, and God was blessing us. We were, we were tithing and doing the whole thing that we're supposed to do, but our stupidity was outrunning God's blessing. That's the best way I could think of to describe it. Like we were being dumber than God could bless us. I'm telling you the truth. That's a real, that's a real deal thing. That really absolutely happens. It happened to me. We were, we were technically doing everything the Bible said to do, and he was throwing open the floodgates of heaven, and we were letting that water flow into a ditch. I don't know what we were thinking. It was, it was absolutely ridiculous. So what we did was we, we, we read the Bible more about financial stuff and how to manage our finances and we changed our behavior, and then God's blessing began to catch up. We found the solution was more practical and spiritual than anything else. Like we, merging practicality and spirituality together is not a sin. It's actually very helpful. And our problem was like anybody else's. We needed good biblical answers 
to what was happening. So let's take some words from Jesus, and I just want to break this down. If you've got your Bible with you, um, you'll notice in the handout that we're going to be in Luke 12 almost exclusively. I got some other scriptures, but if you've got a Bible, you could camp out in Luke 12, and that would be cool. It says this, and this is the special translation I wanted to start with, not the one I normally read, but bear with me. Luke 12, verse 15, out of the ESV, it says, take care now. <laughs> take care, y'all. And be on your guard against all covetousness. I want you to say it with me. Covetousness. Let's say it again. Covetousness. You got to say it like you're like from the south and you go to church every day of your life. Covetous. It's like such a, man, that is a Bible word. If I've ever heard a Bible word, that's one. That's right there. Who says that? Covet. Co say it three times fast. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do it. Don't do that. I got two problems with this, this translation. All, these translations are all right, but I got two problems with this one. The first one's take care now. It sounds like I'm leaving my uncle's house who lives in Tennessee. Take care now. Y'all buckle up. Use your turn signal. Take care. It's just like a very minor sense of urgency. Very minor. Very just easygoing. Just take care. Just a normal greeting. And I, I think that misrepresents what Jesus like the kind of warning Jesus was getting at. So uh, take care is one. And then the real problem is covetousness. It's just, it's just not a word we use. Of course, if you spent any time in church, you probably know what covet means. It means to want, to crave, or desire. Does that mean I'm not supposed to want, crave, or desire God? No. That's not what that means. Let's go back to Exodus 20, where in Exodus we see the Ten Commandments, and that's where covet really comes from. It says this. Exodus 20, verse 17, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servants, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Just for fun, the title of this message is Beware the Donkeys. Because Be, that's, what, that's what we really need to learn about in church, okay? You spent, you got all ready, you got dressed up, you came all the way to church. What do I need to know from the Bible? Donkeys. Oxes, don't want donkeys, check. Thanks, pastor. Really helpful, really helpful. People wanting other people's donkeys, that's the real problem. Now, right about now is when you're thinking, this message is not for me. This message is not for me. I don't covet, I don't have donkeys, I don't want donkeys. I don't want oxes. Uh, I got a spouse, and I don't even think I can handle another one. So I don't want my neighbor's spouse. Oh, okay, let's, let's bridge the gap. Okay, it's like not wanting your neighbor's car. Well, I don't want my neighbor's car, but I want one just like it. Okay, it's not, well, I don't struggle with that. Maybe you're thinking that. I've thought it too. I'm not, I don't, cov I, I'm not covetousness. I don't need that. I just feel, I'm, I feel relatively content. But let's, let's, let's think about this. Is Jesus' warning to us irrelevant? Really? Because that's what we're saying. If it's like, no, this is not for me. I don't, I don't struggle with that. Let's, let's read a different translation just to see if we can grab a bigger picture of what Jesus was really trying to say. Out of the NLT, I, I love this translation. It's the one I read every single day. Luke 12, 15. Then he said, beware. Watch out. Wait. <laughs> beware. It's much stronger. I like that already right out of the gate. He said, Beware. Guard against every kind of greed, because life is not measured by how much you own. First of all, take care versus beware is like the difference between a little like a little sign right here by the step that's like you might scrape your knee. Take care now, you might you might get a little bruise. But beware is the sign outside the Grand Canyon. You will die. Okay, do not tread on me because you will fall in, and it's so far. It's so far down. So first of all, we're on, we're on a good track because Jesus, that was his tone. Watch out for this. You need to be careful about this. And then the word greed, which again, we understand it, but you'd be tempted to think, not me. I'm not greedy. No way. Let's talk about the real word that Jesus used. It was in Greek, and the real word is pleonexia. Pleonexia. Oh, man, like I'm a gringo so bad right now. I know it. Every time Hebrew, Greek, whatever, I, it's such a white guy way of saying it. Pleonexia, I don't know. I'm so sorry. But that's the word. That's how you spell it right there. And then it, it, it means this, a strong desire to acquire more and more and more and more and more material possessions. It's materialism. And or to have more than other people, comparison. Comparison and materialism. Oh, yeah, that doesn't exist in our world. No way. No, I don't see. I'm, pff, no way. That's not, 
Jesus was giving a big heartfelt warning about greed, materialism, and comparison, 16 out of 38 parables. And that's not the extent of all he talked about. Those are just the parables. There's like 2,000 scriptures in the Bible all about finances. I wonder why. Because people are obsessed about money and refuse to admit it. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Let me get into this for a second. Greed and pride share this trait. Greed and pride share this special trait. It is nearly impossible to see it in yourself and nearly impossible to miss in someone else. It's true. You can spot pride from across the room. Some wa- mm-hmm, just like walking in, just the way they talk, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah uh, the, the example is like, you know, my humility, I'm known for my humility. And if you don't see the issue with that, you might be a... Someone who struggles with with pride. <laughs> I'm not. When it comes to humility, I'm the best. <laughs> Just, we could go on, but uh, greed. How about how about this one? Greed, um, materialism, comparison. Uh, p- some people just hate when preachers talk about money. But why? What am I saying that Jesus didn't already teach? Another way to say greed is withholding with what God said to give. That's one way of of saying that. It's like that that grasping right here. We, we think of people, when we say greed, it's never us. It's rich people who cheat on their taxes. Those are greedy people, right? Come on, can I get an amen on that? And who's rich? Whoever has more money than you. <laughs> Nobody in here thinks they're rich. It's always the next neighborhood up. They're the rich ones. No, no, no. Well, hang on a second. That's not fair. Because then when you move into that neighborhood, oh, well, it's the, it's the next neighborhood. It's, it's very deceptive. Greed is very sneaky and it's not reserved for the rich it's an equal opportunity (laughs) employer (laughs) listen to what led up to jesus's um, statement on greed luke 12 again i tell you the truth everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth the son of man will also acknowledge in the presence of god's angels but anyone who denies me here on earth will be denied before god's angels anyone who speaks against the son of man can be forgiven but anyone who blasphemes the holy spirit will not be forgiven Whoa. Um, and then you, you are, when you are brought up to trial in the synagogues before the rulers and authorities, don't worry how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit's going to teach you at that time what needs to be said. Whoa. That's a, that's a lot of stuff that he just brought up. Man, I could do a, a series on all of those hard statements. Man, he's going to tell you what to say. Whoever blasphemes the Holy Spirit, by the way. By the way, that is such, uh, every time I do a Bible study and includes this verse, let me just explain to you what that means. Our English, our English way of reading that means if I've ever said anything bad about God, I'm going to hell forever. Like, that's not what that means. It's not. It simply means whoever acknowledges and receives Jesus will be saved, but whoever truly rejects him and settles in that will not be saved. It's, it's, it's. It's the gospel you understand and know, hopefully. It's the same. It's not like if you had a bad night, drank too much, and said something mean about God, you will not be forgiven. That's not, that's not what it means. It's not. And you would think that's what the people would follow up with. Right? Like he just said so much stuff that's hard to understand. Won't the people, that's verse 12, won't the people go into that? Won't they, won't they want to know more about that? <laughs> Verse 13, the very next verse, someone called out from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide my father's estate with me. (laughs) Did I miss a verse? Like what, where did that come from? Oh yeah, heaven, hell, yada, 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 yada. I get it, I get it, I get it. Blaspheming, whatever, whatever. So what about my money? This is the very next, the, the people who put the Bible together, they had to insert like a heading there to make it make sense because it doesn't. And we don't. We don't make sense sometimes. We're standing before the Son of God, right? Before the Son of God, standing in front of you, telling you how to get to heaven. And we're worried about our jobs. And we're worried about finances. When he said so clearly, guys, I'm going to take care of you. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. You're, You're fine. You're fine. But, you know, beware of all kinds of greed. That's what he said. That's what he said. If you think about, and if you think you're above all this, I know some of you might be hunkering down on that. Like, I don't struggle with this, man. Then you must not be human. Because Proverbs says right here, Proverbs 27, 20, human desire is never truly satisfied. You know what that means to me? As long as we're human, 
we're going to need to come back to this topic. As long as we are human beings living in a material world, oh, I tried to resist, but I just, oh, one of these days I'm going to get better at speaking. I'm going to be able to resist my urges in front of everybody. We need to be reminded often about this topic because it's a sneaky one. It creeps up on us, and next thing you know, we're, we're just wrapped up in it. And so what do we do? Let, we, we've talked about the issue. Let's talk about the solution for a second. There is an equation for contentment, and it goes like this. Want less, give more, and you will live better. Want less. And I, I labored over these words. I don't even think I nailed it. I, I started with buy less. And I was like, that's not right. Uh, and then I went to want less, which is a little closer. But I hope you get the essence of it. It's like that desire. It's that, it's that inner voice that's like kind of like reaching out for the next thing. That's what we need to do less of. I, I struggled with the articulation, but I hope you understand as I continue to explain this process. Want less, give more, live better. This is the prescription to heal an unsatisfied soul. Lots of problems are easy to diagnose. This is my kids, but it works real good. <laughs> it really does. I like was tapping on it earlier and hurt myself, hurt my ears on it. So imagine this. Guy walks into a doctor, walks into a doctor's office, and he's like, oh, doctor, oh, my knees. <laughs> Listen to my knee. It's like, it doesn't work right. And the doctor's like, okay, okay, okay. Listen to the man's heart. I mean, because he looks pretty fit. So he goes, Okay, sounds good. Listen to the lungs. What are they even listening for back there? Can anyone tell me? Like, what? Fluid? Like, what does fluid sound like? I don't know. <laughs> sounds good. You sound, <laughs> sounds healthy. Okay. And he asks about his diet. Doctor asks about his diet. Oh, sounds pretty good. Keto? Oh, man, that's the best diet in the whole world. You must be so super healthy. Wow. Wow. And you're so intelligent and handsome, too, the doctor says to this make-believe man. Um, and then he, uh, the, the doctor says, you know, something, um, you know, asks a random question. Do you run by chance? The guy's like, oh, that's incredible. How did you know? Oh, you're in great health but have trash knees? You're a runner. I get it. There's a, the solution. So get on a bike, bro. Get on a bike. Everything's solved. Everything, everything's so good. And the guy's like, man, my mind is so blown right now. The diagnosis for greed the diagnosis for greed is, is, you know, easy to spot from the outside, hard to, to, to see within, and, and, like, especially for runners, too, man. They just can't see, man. You're blowing it. You're blowing it. Get on a bike, man. I just, I can't stand running myself, and I think it's very biblical. The Bible does say, the wicked run when no one is chasing them. <laughs> so let that be a lesson to you. Let that be a lesson to you. If you don't run, you know, I'm just proud of you, you know. Staying away from wickedness. <laughs> No, no, the day, amen, someone said. <gasps> Cheeseburgers after church. Let's go, everybody. It's going to be great. The diagnosis for greed is easy to spot from the outside, and the prescription is not complicated either. Want less, give more, live better. Let's, let's try this again. You got the stethoscope on. I thought I was going to butcher that. I got it. Stethoscope. Oh, what are you saying? You're not happy? Hmm. Discontent? Hmm. Amazon only makes you feel good for a couple hours? Hmm. You got a bunch of debt and payments because you bought a bunch of stuff you didn't need to impress people you don't even care about? Hmm. That's weird. Uh, how about you live in a perpetual state of not thinking you're good enough because you don't have enough? Hmm. Let me ask. When's the last time you really considered your want level and your give level? Diagnosis? Greed has left you discontented. And the prescription? We got to want less. Give more, and guess what? You're going to live better. And just because something is simple doesn't make it easy. I'll give you that. Just because something is simple does not make it easy. So let's talk about this. And, and, and don't get tripped up on the word greed because we think greed and we think, uh, oh, it's a toddler that won't give up their toys. No, it's for grown-ups who can't stop working. It's for people who are really touchy about money. <laughs> um, and it's really all of us, me too, myself included. Like, I, I need reminders too. You know, I'm no different than anybody else. We've got to be reminded of this. So how do we fix it? We've got to want less. Number one, we've got to want less. The next purchase you want to make, why don't we just stop for a second and ask ourselves, do I need this? Do I need this? Like, do I need to buy this right now or should I just pause for a second? Maybe just test it out. You know, the next thing you go to buy, why don't you just put it off and see how that deals with your heart? 
And you're like, oh, I need it right now. You're like scratching your chest. Well, well, hey, well, okay now. Now we're talking. Now we're, now we're really self-diagnosing here. I mean, you can always buy it later if you need, but like maybe we can discipline ourselves a little bit to, to begin to, to limit ourselves. And how about this one? This might sound a little overly spiritual, but you're in church after all. So maybe ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, should I be buying this right now? Do I need this? My cart's got $750 in it on Amazon, okay? Well, I go to the mall and my, my, okay, so a mall is like Amazon, but it's in person. And you go there and you have to take your own stuff to your own house. For those of you uh, under 20, it's, you know, malls, they used to exist. I don't know. There's one in Stockton, I think, still. I don't know. <laughs> maybe asking the Holy Spirit, like, when you're about to check out, just, like, pausing. I, I, I know I could maybe take a break on, on spending, just wanting less, putting myself in check, because that's the practical move. That's the practical side of, Lord, I, I don't want to suffer materialism in comparison, and I don't want to be caught up in that. Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit will say, yeah, go for it. Buy that thing. You go, girl. Come on, let's go. Not just girls, guys too. All right, I see you. And you're, get that crock pot. Yeah, you go for it. God doesn't mind you having nice things. Don't hear me say that. Don't hear me say that this is like he doesn't want you to be rich. This is some kind of poverty message. No, not, not at all. This, I, I already said, equal opportunity. We need to be aware that this is available to all of us to, to, to struggle in, no matter how much money you have or don't have. God doesn't mind you having nice things. Um, he wants you to be free from materialism and all kinds of greed. It's, that's, that's called contentment. He wants you to be content. The point is want, want less, not have less necessarily. Don't let your possessions have you. That's the bottom line. And so let's talk about giving more. Um, this one's simple. I mean, it could be through your church. It could be something like this. Uh, the one kind of outlined, very specific thing that God talks about multiple times on how to give. It could just be that. It could just be that. Or it could be, there could be more to it than that. Uh, giving through your church is God's design. It's his plan. But I hope you know that doesn't cure greed. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if it did, though? Oh, I just write a check, and I don't struggle with any materialism, no greed at all. Obviously, that was not Tiffany and my situation. We tithed and everything. We were pastors. Of course, we, we, we did all the stuff. We did the things we knew God was, but it didn't cure the greed. And so there, it's, it's, it's both and. It's, it's a whole package thing. This is, this is part of it, but it's not the whole thing. So what I want you to see past just the transaction, because it's never, it was never intended to be that. It's, it's always been intended to, to break something up that's locked up in our hearts, always, always. It's like when you, when you buy all the stuff and love the stuff, it has a certain effect on your heart called materialism. You buy the stuff, you love the stuff, you, you, and that's called materialism. But when you give more, like, let's, like giving something away out of your house, like just some random thing. Like you know somebody needs something, so you give it to them. And you go out of your way to bless someone. It doesn't even have to cost much or anything. It's like making a car, doing something special. Getting outside of your own self to give and be generous towards someone else. You see the look on their face? That also has a condition on your heart. It's called generosity. Because it's not, to me, it's not satisfying to just let you know what we're against. Oh, we're against greed here. I want to let you know what we're for. We're for being generous. It's on the wall. We love to give. It's so dark, I can't see. It's the back one. We love to give. We love to give. It's what we're for because it does something inside of us. It's our value. We absolutely love it. Your giving makes a difference in someone else's life. Do these things and you will live better. Let me explain living better. As in with less worries, less stress, less anxiety, you will have a better life on the inside. You'll live better from the inside out. Like we, that's why it's such a mistake to, to talk about giving and say, he's going to make all your dreams come true. And he's going to win the lottery if you do this. And he's just going to get you a job at in and out You know, like whatever the thing is for Leslie. I didn't promise her that. I'm not promising you that. I'm saying it's going to change you on the inside to where you're going to live in a different state where you're free from the bondage of greed. And if Jesus said we should watch out for it, then we really should watch out for it. Um, my dad, my dad, such a special guy. Um, I love him. I love him. He's, 
like such an inspiration to me in so many ways, and this is one of the reasons. Uh, he, he was never much of a churchy guy. You know, we weren't raised in church. I already told you guys that a hundred times. But he just, he wasn't much of a churchy guy, but he was and is very generous, a very generous man. Very, very uh, mild-mannered and doesn't talk much. I take after my mom, obviously. <laughs> um, but my dad, instead of splurging on whatever he wanted, he, he had a tendency towards saving. He would save uh, so that we would be okay, the family would be okay if, if trouble ever came. And one day it did. My dad was an accountant. We were just middle class. You know, they didn't have all the nicest stuff in the world. We didn't have all the nicest stuff, but we didn't have nothing. We were just right middle, you know, just kind of average, middle middle class. That's how I was raised. And, and one day he lost his job. And one month goes by, two months goes by, six months goes by. And I'm watching him. And I, I, don't, I can't remember exactly how old. I was old enough to know what was going on. And I asked my mom, like, what's going on? What? he doesn't have a job how come we're not like how come we're not having to move how come we're not like what's why isn't anything wrong and my mom told me your father has put enough aside so that we would be okay in case anything happened and sure enough we were (laughs) we were okay and and the, the the thing i'm trying to highlight is my dad wasn't even stressed because it wasn't like how do I explain? He said no to a lot of things. We could have gone to Disneyland, probably a lot. He could have been driving a really nice car and a new one every three months or three years or whatever, but he didn't do all that stuff. Instead, he, was, he, he put things aside. It said he wasn't focused on having all the nicest things. What he really said no to, instead of not, not just saying no to vacations and saying no to, he was saying no to greed. That's what my dad taught me. My dad taught me to say no to greed. I didn't always get it right. But I always think back and remember him teaching me that. We have an opportunity to start something new in our generation with our kids. I want to do the same thing for my kids. This is, in doing this, he was being about the most godly man I've ever met. Because he put other people's needs ahead of his own. He thought of others before he thought of himself and what he wanted and what he thought he had to have. It wasn't the money that saved us during that hard time. It was my dad's heart and mindset, guarding against greed, putting off immediate and temporary indulgences to store up treasures for something that were more worthwhile, which leads me to what Jesus kind of finishes up with in this story of Luke 12. He told him this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and... There I'll store my surplus grain. And I say to myself, I have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, be merry, buy everything I want. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is going to be demanded of you. And then who will get all that you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God. It's a both end. Like, it's not just about, it's not about poverty. It's not about being poor. It's about that has a tendency to keep us from being rich towards God and the things of God. The benefits of riches and 401ks and investments are obvious. You get power and authority, financial security, vacations, fair weather friends. (laughs) If you know, you know. Fair weather friends. But riches have the same weakness. They can't buy you anything once you're dead. And that's kind of the point. No one... No one wants to hold on to their investment portfolio on their deathbed. They want to hold on to the hands of the people they love. What if we could keep that in our minds during our life, not just on our deathbed? And remember that there are more important things. I need to focus on these things because I have symptoms of financial issues. But God says there's an answer to this. But it's, a lot, it's simple, but it may not be easy. And that's why I'll be praying for you this month. And I, I know it's such a, such a common area of, of pain and a source of trouble. We want to be there for you. So we as the church are going to be praying for you. What you buy now is nice for now. What you save now is good for a rainy day. Nothing against that, obviously. But your generosity impacts eternity. 
what you are generous with makes an eternal difference. And that is the major difference between saving and earning and everything we can do financially. What we're generous with has an impact on, on eternity like nothing else does. Did you know people get saved because of generosity? You are sitting your booties in people's generosity. Like everything, everything you see, everything you're experiencing, the fact that you know pastors can study more, all of that has to do with people's generosity. Your generosity makes an eternal difference. If we can, can tear our eyes and our hearts and our souls from the immediate needs and wants of the present, it's really gonna make us happier. Truly it will. And we'll learn like Jesus to be rich towards God and we'll live better because we'll be living with eternity in mind. The more you're generous, the more you live with eternity in mind as you go. And that's what we want. That's what any good, reasonable pastor would want is to think about eternity all day. That to be thinking about these things. And if eternity and heaven and hell worries you, like, ugh, if that gives you any kind of apprehension, thinking about heaven and hell and, and where you're going to go when you pass away and just like all of that stuff, you just rather not think about it. I want to give you an opportunity to have an encounter moment with God because that's what he wants. First and foremost, he wants your heart. He doesn't need, he, just, like, just like we like to say, and God is the same, he doesn't need anything from us. He wants everything for us. He wants everything for you. And, and I just had this scripture in mind, not on the screens, but just in my heart. Matthew 6, It was written on my very first Bible I ever owned. It was written in there for me. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. You'll have everything you need. That's my prayer for you. I pray that you would have everything you need, that you would just put him first. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Father, thank you so much for the gift of your son, Jesus. And you, you gave so freely. You gave us free will. You gave your son. God so loved the world that he gave. We are, we are the recipients of your generosity. So Lord, help us to think about this as not simply a, a financial thing. This has to do with our souls. This has to do with our spirit. Generosity is eternal. And Lord, I just pray for every single person here who just needs to be on the receiving end of some generosity. Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for bringing them here today. I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity to, to share with them the good news that Jesus gave himself for them. And I pray right now for open hearts and open minds to receive that gift. If you feel as if your, your relationship with God is not exactly where it should be, or if you want to be taking steps towards him in relationship, would you just lift your hand up? And I want to know who I'm praying for here. Just lift your hand up and say, that's me. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Jesus. Amen. Oh my God. I'm so grateful for you. And I'm going to pray for you. And church, we're going to pray together, okay? Let's pray this as a family, as a spiritual family. It's just a simple prayer of salvation to receive the love of Jesus. If you would, if it's in your heart, just pray it out with me. Say, Father God, I give you my heart. I give you my life. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on a cross for my sin. I receive that generosity. Fill me with your spirit and show me the path that I should walk. Amen. Amen. Amen.